Evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this beautifully renovated Borough Hall in Dunoon. It really is a, a credit to the thought and work that's gone into it. Um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but before I start, we will have uh, direct debit forums on offer for those of you who would like to contribute on a monthly basis to the, the forward uh, success of the, the Yes Movement and the Forward Shop. There will also be strategically placed buckets at various corners of the place in the course of the night. Um, our guest speaker tonight doesn't need a, a, a great deal of introduction from me. I'm sure she's well known to you all. A background, a very solid background in journalism for almost every major paper in Scotland. Uh, frequent appearances on radio and on television. And with her own, what is it, feisty productions, productions of your own productions. Uh, she, Leslie was involved in the, the fight to try and keep the tower, Castle Tower in public ownership. Um, the, the men's hut and the allotments campaign here. Um, she is also doing a PhD in Nordic studies between Strathclyde and Oslo University. And I believe you still find some time to cycle yeah. after that. <laughs> so the subject tonight, which join, we, the, the subject tonight will be Scotland's place in a future Nordic, uh, Nordic settlement. I now introduce Leslie Ruddock, thank you very much indeed. I am glad for a holiday dog, but I speak a little Norsk, so the rest is in English. Right. <laughs> I had to use that sentence there because that took me two years to learn Norwegian. And then when I finally got to uh, the archives in Oslo uh, for this PhD, and I was kind of in the archives. I got the blue gloves on because I was dealing with historic documents. I was kind of beside myself with excitement. I had actually got a grant from the Norwegian government to be doing this research even. Um, and finally, I opened the first books uh, that I was studying, and they were in Danish. <laughs> My, how I laughed. But... Uh, it just shows you that kind of lifelong learning really is just what it says on the can, you know, because actually when you calm down and look at it, Danish and, and Norwegian are actually quite similar. So I managed to stutter on. But anyway, um, there's probably, actually it's great to be in this hall again is the first thing. What a stoting hall. Um, the time that I was here last, uh, we were just remembering, was, was launching the, the Castle Tower community buyout bid. Uh, what a shame that was. I mean, shame on the council, shame, um, but not shame for you. You know, I know people have been thwarted and felt it just the trouble is it brings, it, it makes it so difficult for people to imagine a better life. When the people you elect and the institutions around you are wrong shaped and are stopping initiative, then the fact that so many people in this room can still see past that to better possibilities is a great tribute to everybody here. Um, I can tell John, you're gonna be my big fan all night here, right? So kinda just, just keep, it, keep it under control there, my friend. Um, so anyway, that was the last time I was here. And as I recall, there was not a back wall. I can remember thinking I've never actually done anything where there just isn't a back wall. And it was strangely mesmerizing. I don't know if you remember it. <laughs> the kind of flapping curtain, you know, behind the nothingness of the back wall. So, I mean, this is extraordinary now. And uh, just well done, everybody that was involved in it. Um, there's plenty of things we could talk about tonight. And I, I can kind of well imagine, you know, we've got the endless Brexit nonsense. We've got um, Scottish Labour kind of just, I don't know, mo yet more stabbing themselves in the front uh, when they could be moving a little bit behind Jeremy Corbyn and so on. There's plenty of stuff that's happening. But I mean, in many respects, that's weather. And what we need to think about is climate change. I mean, some transformational change for us. And to, to kind of get yourselves oriented, that's where um, I've been very busy kind of going around the Nordic countries, because seeing is believing. And uh, when you begin to spend a lot of time in small northern countries who, I mean, if anybody thinks they're remote, you're not remote. 
Uh, try, you know, the Arctic regions of, of any of the Nordic countries for genuinely remote. And yet, for those of you who've been there, you'll see that they've actually got phenomenal in infrastructure, much better than stuff that's sitting cheek by jowl with Glasgow. We have accepted a sort of um, a, a substandard Scotland, a, a substandard life in many respects, um, which, which really hinges on an awful lot of, of things that are missing in the setup of how Britain works. And Scotland has been a part of Britain for a guy long time. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do um, is to sort of try and get our thinking changed a bit, um, to look a little bit at what our Nordic neighbours have done. Because actually, when you realise the posse that we're sitting in the midst of, it's breathtaking, truly, what the possibilities could be. Um, if we just start off, first of all, with the Pharaohs. Has anybody been in the Pharaohs? It's always, I think it's like everyone's last Monroe, the Pharaohs. I only got there last year. And they truly are amazing. This is 18 barren little lumps of rock that are stuck between Shetland and Iceland. Tremendously isolated. Um, what they've got going for them? Fish. And yet the Pharaohs, at the time, population 30,000, were, were given the world's most powerfully devolved parliament in 1946. And this is worth knowing because it's the reason that they are out of the EU whilst Denmark is in. And that's worth knowing because we get given a line here that it's one singer, one song, one size fits all. And that actually speaks volumes about the kind of country we live in that cannot tolerate diversity and doesn't believe in different paths. That's weird. I mean, we don't like it, I guess, a lot of people are in here because that kind of rankles, but it's weird. And what we need to get is how exceptional that centralized state is in the great scheme of things, because we're not sitting with neighbors who think like that. To go back to the Pharaohs, um, in 1946, they decided to become independent from Denmark. Now, that's a short sentence that is mind-blowing in what it really means. This is 30,000 people. What's the population of Danun and Kilmun? And you stick the whole thing together, what do you get? Just over 10? Okay, what are we going to do? Danun and Rothsey? Right, I know you're probably a bit funny about me putting Rothsey in the same sentence, but let's say Danun and Rothsey decide to become independent about 100 miles from the Arctic. That's kind of pretty brave. And that's what they were going for. They had, an, they had a referendum in 1946, and the result was 50.7% yes. And that kind of put the cat amongst every single set of pigeons, because it sort of flummoxed people. It was a marginal vote, um, but it really flummoxed the Danes. And the Danes did something that I don't think the British government could ever do, which is they realized they had to persuade people to stay. And so that's why in 1946, um, the Faroese were given this incredibly powerful parliament. Okay, it raises its own taxes, all the things you would expect from a truly powerful parliament, but it also runs all its energy resources, which is, would have been in our case, an extremely powerful thing. And it's got control of telecoms. Now that we thing might seem not very big, um, but what it means for them is that the Faroese have got the world's fastest 4G coverage. The Faroes. And how did they do this? Um, I'm glad you're sitting down because this might be a shock to your system. The Faroese government told Faroese Telecom to do it. I mean, I know that's fiendishly kind of simple and kind of offensively simple to what we have learned to understand as the necessary bureaucracy and privatized nonsense of how we go about tasks. But Faroese Telecom took the job, made it bespoke to the islands they were in because, hey, again, don't get up because this is a heady one. They live there. And what they produced was 4G coverage that covers all the 18 islands, even as, as kind of isolated as they are. But it also goes out to 200 miles, which is the self-declared limit of fishing that the Faroese declared, so that all the fishing boat, boats are on 4G and up to the height of the helicopters that service the fleet. And when, when I was kind of slightly bowled over by that, they said, but why wouldn't we do that? That's our world. Whew. Now, that's 
my normal. I'm making that my normal. I'm refusing to accept the way we behave as normal. It's weird. It's counterproductive. It's perverse. It's the tail end of a discredited way of operating. And we have to think differently. And it's easier to think differently when you see people working perfectly easily with better models because seeing is believing. Anyway, um, the Faroese also have a university that teaches in their own language. They are now a heady 40,000 people and they teach in their own language in schools as well. They've got a very good sense of themselves, the Faroese. Um, and the reason that their situation exists so particularly is because they were given one final cherry on the cake when it came to their parliament. They were given, in 1946, they were given the right to sign international treaties. Now, the next time anybody starts coming our way with Scotland being the most powerfully devolved parliament in the world, ask them if we can sign international treaties, because we can't. And that was done in 1946. Ooh, that's kind of quite a while ago, isn't it? So actually, that was a norm within the Danish state for a very long time. So that's the reason that in 1973, when motherland Denmark decided to join the EU, same time as Britain was doing it, the Faroese took one look at the common fishing policy and went, nah, that doesn't need a for us. And um, apart from anything else, they would have to let other nationalities into their waters. They just weren't having it. And like us, they have a mixed fishery. I'm slightly at a loss to see what fish, what seas do not have mixed fisheries. With a quota system, that is just a recipe for discards. Um, so there was all sorts of reasons the Faroese just didn't want to do it. And, and, and here's the thing. I see that some of us around here were kind of knocking about in 1973. You'll remember nobody died. There was no stushy whatsoever. The Faroese went their own sweet way. Denmark joined. The Faroese didn't. It was fine. Um, and when Greenland got the opportunity to follow the Faroes, when it was given the same sort of power of parliament as the, the Faroes, um, in 1982, the first thing the Greenlands did, out of the EU. And that's for exactly the same reason, because of the fishing policy. And that's the reason you might have heard in the discussions that happened while we were all still kidding ourselves on that Theresa May might ever listen to anybody about anything. Um, you might have heard discussion of the reverse Greenland, because basically Greenland left the EU while the mother state was still in, while we would be staying in while the mother state was leaving. I mean, all of this, you know, you get had up with detail. Um, and I read a tremendous piece by an Irish writer who said um, that that is actually one of the distinctive ploys of the British state, is to get you stuck in detail so you didn't stand back and think about points of principle. The point of principle at stake was that um, a, a small territory with a defined set of interests could have a parliament of its own right up to the stage of signing international treaties and it would still be okay. So that's those guys. Um, further north than them, the Icelanders are also famously not in the EU. In fact, the Icelanders had a big impact on the Faroese because in 1944, the Icelanders decided to become independent. Um, the mother state, Denmark, was occupied by Germany, so basically they weren't in much of a position to argue. So the Icelanders, who'd been wanting to become independent for a very long time, just basically declared UDI. 1944, Ofsky. Um, so that really is why the Danes were absolutely determined when they had the chance to deal with the Faroes differently, they were determined to hang on to them. Not because they were too worried about 40,000 Faroese folk, the 200 miles of fish, and potentially what was to, to ever, ever else was to come. So Iceland, um, anyone been to Iceland? Aye, it's a marvellous place, isn't it? Um, they're mad. I mean, I say this in a really, they are incredible people. Um, half their DNA, the male DNA, is largely Norse. The female DNA is largely Celtic because they basically stole women all the way up the west coast from Ireland to uh, the Western Isles. And of course, the Norwegians, who are much more rational people, um, think that it's that Celtic streak that caused the crash in 2008 because the Nordic bit would never have been that wild a child, you see. But um, 
but actually, they are really quite extraordinary people. I mean, Iceland was discovered three times before anyone stayed. Uh, it's, it's a pretty difficult place. Um, the second lot who came back to Norway, and you'll know this, the Viking slogan is, Vikings don't go back. So, you know, going back to Norway when you've sort of been off to find new lands, that was a bit, bit embarrassing. So um, the, the line they gave was that they'd found this land, but nobody could possibly live there. It was an ice land. It was, there was nothing habitable on it. Those of you who've gone will know that that's not true. It, it, Iceland's actually below the Arctic. It does have glaciers, but so does Switzerland. Um, in fact, it should more correctly be called lava land. A third of all the lava flows on Earth have flowed on Iceland. Um, and for that reason, it has finally got to be able to harness the massive geothermal power that's, that lies there. And that really has been part of the story of Iceland's success. Um, but the Icelanders looked at, uh, they looked at trade with Europe and they ruled out joining the EU early doors. We had um, a, a conference, Nordic Horizons had a conference last year with speakers from all the Nordic countries and the object was to explain how many different ways, this is one of my mother's ones, there are a skin a cat. I mean, that's a terrible expression. Where did that ever come from? But I mean, the point is, we've got this one way of doing it. And actually, the Nordic countries have dis discovered all sorts of different ways to have relationships with Europe, depending on the interests of their nation. And they have spent time creating a consensus so that there is absolute agreement about what those strategic interests are. I mean, funnily enough, we're sort of getting there in Scotland. You'll notice that Ruth Davidson, on a good day, actually wants to stay in the single market as well. Um, so, you know, there is that same thing happening here, but they have a much keener sense of their, their national interests. Anyway, um, we, one of the speakers was an Icelander called Jon Baldwin Hannibalson. And this guy, if I'd actually known more about this guy before I introduced him, I wouldn't have been able to sit beside him out of sheer awe. Um, I should say this guy, Jon Baldwin, took Iceland into um, the halfway house that is the EEA. We'll explain that in a minute. But perhaps his bigger claim to fame is that in 1991, Lithuania uh, declared independence. And within days, the Soviet troops had come in and 14 people were dead at the TV station. Uh, it looked like that little flickering moment of the Baltic Republic's flexing their muscles and creating freedom was about to end. And a wee guy got on a plane in Reykjavik, flew to Lithuania, went straight to the heart of all that trouble and formally recognized Lithuania as a state on behalf of the 250,000 people who live on Iceland. I mean, it's extraordinary. Within four days, other countries had recognized Lithuania. Within six months, it was a member of the UN. The next thing that happened was Latvia, the next Estonia. And each time, the first formal recognition of independence was made by Iceland, by Jon Baldwin Hannibalsen. I mean, what a guy. Um, Estonia, uh, their foreign ministry is, is now located in one Iceland square. So they don't forget. And the Lithuanian parliament has a plaque right at the entrance to it, thanking Iceland who came when others did not dare. 250,000 people. That's what you can do when you're focused, when you're independent. Um, the, the, the reason they, he went, I was quite staggered. I was, I was researching this book and was determined to to um, John Baldwin is writing in the book about the Icelandic experience. And I just wanted to put a bit more about each of the writers in because we didn't know them. So this is how I found this out. He doesn't go around telling everybody. Um, and I said to him, why on earth did you feel you had to intervene? And he said, well, you know, what was happening at the time was that the Western um, allies had basically decided that Gorbachev could do what he wanted because the big prize was to make sure that Russia didn't slip back into communism. And small transgressions like killing 14 people in Lithuania, or in fact flattening all the Baltic states' attempts to become independent, that could sort of be overlooked in the greater scheme of things. And the Icelanders thought, no. Nah. I mean, one, that's wrong. And two, we are a little country. 
we need other little countries. It's in our interest to make sure that that kind of diversity thrives and that the interests and independence of small countries is a big issue. So that's the reason he said, I had no choice. I got on the plane. Well, blow me, what a guy. So that's Iceland's attitudes. And you can believe then that when Iceland approached the idea of what relations it wanted with the EU, um, there was no real enthusiasm for becoming part of the uh, European Union. Um, first of all, they had this big problem with fish again, because most of their economy is dependent on that. But as Jan Balvin said, they hadn't spent 600 years trying to get out of Danish colonial rule to be hand in powers back to Brussels. Now, that might have some resonance for people <laughs> in certain other respects, but that's how the Icelanders saw it. And a more independent-minded, I mean, cussedly independent-minded bunch of people you simply couldn't come across. Um, of course, after they had the crash, they did have a short dalliance with the thought of joining the EU, but by the time they'd stuck some bankers in jail, well done, um, and reversed an awful lot. One of the first things they did as soon as they traded themselves into any kind of profit as a nation again was that they doubled child benefit. Yes. What did the Finns do when they responded to the crash in 2008? They trebled research and development. Yes. These are the kind of people we need to be knocking about with. These are our kind of guys. We need to learn these sorts of lessons. So there's Iceland. Um, however, sitting slightly lonely as a cloud in the middle of the Atlantic with a lot of geothermal energy and quite a few aluminium companies as well, um, Iceland did feel the need to have some kind of trade deal with uh, Europe. And so Jan Balvin, as well as saving Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, devised the EEA. This is the science bit. It lasts 30 seconds and it's painless, right? Um, but basically, when the EU was starting off in the 60s, 70s, there were two kids on the block, not just one trade club, but two. There was the EEC that became the, e the EU, and there was also EFTA, it's still there. That's the European Free Trade Association. Now these guys, EFTA, didn't want to integrate, didn't want to have a currency, didn't want institutions, didn't want any big fandango, they just wanted trade. And actually, although they started off with nine members, all of the Nordics plus all of the Alpine states, curious bunch actually, the way, way that one worked, um, the sort of muesli crowd basically, um, they all peeled off uh, and joined the EU with all its burgeoning institutions and everything. That seemed a lot more powerful and interesting, except for four states who are now the EFTA members. That's Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Switzerland. Now, of those, those four, three of them want to have access to the EU single market. That's a wee bit like maybe you're a member of a club, some sort of gym thing, and you occasionally want a day pass into a swankier one to impress your friends or go to a, I don't know, something kind of dead hot like a jacuzzi or something. Um, you want to be able to have access to a different club. Well, three of them decided to pay through the nose for that. And that is the European economic area. What that is, is the three EFTA people who want to be in the single market, I haven't got enough fingers here, but the 28 soon to become 27 members of the EU, together is the EEA. And you can't get into the EEA without being a member of EFTA, and you can't finally get into the EEA without the approval of all the EU members. Now, at the moment, there's kind of a lot of sabre rattling going on about Britain potentially becoming a, a member there, because that would seem to sort of satisfy the crazy uh, desire to be both in and out of things at the same time. Um, but actually, it would need the approval of every single EU member to do that. Now, it's possible, but I don't know about you, it just strikes me that an awful lot of people are pretty pissed off with uh, Britain at the moment, and the small EFTA countries do not want it. Iceland is biddable, Norway is implacably opposed, even though it has a conservative government. It just would wreck their world. So there's one lineup for Scotland. Um, if we were to become, when we become independent, if we were to think of joining EFTA, that halfway house, there's a posse. What do you get? 
Well, you get that you can have access to the single market. You get to share research funding that still goes on in the EU. You don't end up having to have visas to travel everywhere because you have to observe freedom of movement. Um, you don't have to join the customs union. And the don't haves are quite important. You don't have to join the customs union, which would be useful for Scotland should a Brexited Britain also be out of the customs union in the future. You don't have to be a part of the common agricultural policy. And if the Scottish Government ever starts to mean business about land reform, um, it might consider that the gravy train of common agricultural policy subsidies is in large part shoring up the large pattern of large distant uh, control of land and farming land, which is making a mockery of democracy in Scotland. It's not to say that the, the uh, subsidies are to blame, it's that we have, as you know, 432 people or interests owning half the private land of Scotland. It's an outrage. It's the most concentrated form of land ownership in the developed world. It has changed hardly one iota since I remember starting to campaign about this way back in the days of Assent in 1993, really. Um, and th that those subsidies shore up a bad pattern for us. So a moment where we were able to decide differently how to allocate agricultural subsidies, it sounds boring, it would be revolutionary. And if, if I had my way, it would be a new town council in small councils that would have that sort of decision-making power. Would that increase the number of people that voted locally? I think so. Anyway, I digress. You don't need to be a member of the common agricultural policy and you don't need to be in the common fisheries policy. Now, um, the Norwegians are in a similar boat, like they're in that halfway house. The Norwegians, the, the, the Icelanders joined and never meant to go further because they didn't intend to become EU members. The Norwegians were certain that their population was going to vote yes. Uh, this kind of shows you that living in a capital city can get you offy offy distanced from other people, even in a right on place like Norway, because when they had two referenda, one in the 70s, one in the 90s, on each occasion in Norway, 70% of people in Oslo voted to join the EU and 70% of people everywhere else voted not to. And because Norway has for a long time had a 10 cities policy, where it has very consciously promoted growth all over the country and has also got some of the most um, fulsome subsidies for small family farms, um, there's actually loads of people outside Oslo. It's near a wilderness out there. There's more folk. So it was a combination of farmers thinking, do you know, the only way is down. We join the EU and the kind of really big subsidies we get, stay on the land, have family farms, they're all gone. Um, and the fishermen likewise looked at it and just thought this is a really bad idea. So the Norwegians voted to stay out. And that's where their politicians saw the usefulness of a halfway house. Well, is it? Um, in Norway, the EFTA, the EEA, uh, where they have to abide by all the regulations of the EU, but are not instrumental in making any of them, People grumble, to put it very mildly. It's, it's referred to in Norway as the Nike deal. Just do it. Because Norway complies with 98% of EU regulations, which is a higher proportion than Sweden, which is a member of the EU. So it's not that you get out of the regulations, far from it. Um, you are subject, if you're trading with the EU, you simply have to knuckle down and get on with it. But. Norway's fishing industry is vibrant. It is employing far more people than Scotland. It is not pillaging the oceans. It is observing conservation. And the fishermen, the conservationists, the academics get together and decide what the quotas, they don't operate on a quota basis, decide how they will manage the seas. The result is that they have something like two to three times higher uh, stocks than us in key species. And of course, the sea doesn't observe a border. So it's in their interests for us to get our act together too. So they have quite a strong interest in the Scots getting control of their own fisheries again and managing them better. But managing them better means stopping thinking 
the way that we have done for quite some time. So right, this is a long way round saying there's a possible deal, folks. If we were to join EFTA, the halfway house, there's our new chums. We realise our reality as a North Atlantic state. We are. We are in the North Atlantic. Our interests are there. The world's interests are there. These plucky little countries of 40,000 and 20,000 and a glorious 300,000, which is all Iceland is today, are guarding the Arctic against the depredations of the likes of America and Russia, who both have skin in the game thanks to Siberia and Alaska. Is that not another scary thought? Not just that Trump has his finger on the nuclear button, but he's got access to the Arctic Council as well as a member? So the little countries, the same way as Lithuania in 1991, little countries the world over need other little countries to stand up and get on with it. And when I was in the Faroes, um, I was speaking about Scotland, Brexit and independence. And I was astonished that there was a crowd almost the same size as your own gala selves uh, arriving on a Tuesday night in, in uh, Torshaven, which is their, ca their capital's town. And um, I asked them what was the big interest in all of this. And one guy put it really well. He said, for us, Scotland is a sleeping giant. It's not a wee place. If you're sitting with 40,000 people in your world, you know, Scotland's got roundabouts. <laughs> Lots of them. You know, we've got forests. We've got unbelievable amounts of stuff really mind-blowing assets, huge numbers of universities, they've got one. From the point of view, from the perspective of the Arctic, where the future resources of the world are sitting, we are the next big thing. In every respect, physically, democratically, they're waiting. They're waiting for us to wake up and realise the power that we have and the people that we should be aligned with. So they're there's one possibility. That's the EFTA club of the North Atlantic. Um, but actually, the great thing for an independent Scotland is that it doesn't just have one option, it's got two. Now, you know, it's extraordinary that politicians and, and the media can portray this as a problem. You know, we've got two possible options here and we might have to think about what the best one is. Lordy, lordy. Well, the other option is pretty tasty as well, actually. I mean, we talk, if you, if you look at the other extreme, going right over, it's not the right way for you, right over to the east, in the same way that fish has been the governing factor for the North Atlantic states of the Nordics, Russia is the governing factor of the east. Um, you, you may know that the Finns um, had two incursions, wars with Russia to try and retain control of an area called Karelia. Um, unbelievably, they managed to fight off the, the Red Army the first time round and were the stars of the Western world. Churchill described them as heroes and uh, praised their Sisu. That word entered the language then. Sisu means smedum. Um, then the Russians came back and they lost that territory and decided to go back in to get it back with Hitler. Now, that was a bad call. Um, they paid for it. They ended up having to make an agreement with Russia in 1948 to pay back whacking great loads of reparations. Actually, the Americans, everybody was kind of feeling a bit sorry for them because they entered none of the battle for uh, Leningrad or the big cities. They only occupied the bits of land, which actually nobody else would even have thought was important. But um, they were offered Marshall Plan money and they refused it. They decided they were going to pay their debt and they would not be helped out. And they paid it back in kind. What was the biggest thing that they ended up developing? Mobile telephony. Now, so that, you know, about 10 years ago, you would all immediately have gone, right, Nokia, how, how the mighty are fallen. But that's where Nokia began. It began through the obligations that were being paid off to the Russians. So the Finns have had their, are blooming resilient people. 
but they have also been very conscious that they are living beside a difficult neighbour, shall we say. Um, Ludovic Kennedy was quoting Pierre Trudeau, I think, when he talked about um, Scotland being in bed with an elephant. And he wasn't really trying to be unpleasant about the English. He was simply talking about relative size, 5 million versus 60 million. Um, Canada in the same position with America. Well, if those countries feel they're in bed with an elephant, Finland is in bed with a stegosaurus. It is a massive country that is constantly expansionist and unpredictable. Um, so the Finns realized uh, they had independence in 1917. They're about to celebrate that 100th anniversary. They realized a key part of staying independent was being neutral. So they have that in their constitution. They have a constitutional bar on membership of NATO to say to the Russians, look, honest gov, there will never be an American base on Finnish soil. You don't need to worry about it. It's not going to happen. The Swedes are the same. The Swedes have a constitutional bar. That's how important neutrality is to those Baltic states. So for the Finns, where is their security policy? They can't be a member of NATO. That's why they are such keen members of the EU. They joined the EU. They're the only Nordic country that's also joined the Euro. They are believers. Um, the the uh, connection with the EU does lots for them in terms of foreign policy. It anchors them to a Western mindset, which they're very keen to keep. Um, and it makes them think of themselves as a kind of modern social democracy. So for the, for the Finns, that's the reason why for them being in the EU works pretty big style. Now, who knows if it came push to shove, if there was some incursion into Finland, would the EU rush to fin Finland's defence in the same way as NATO members are obliged to do, far cans. But there's a very strong likelihood of it because the Finns have been very vigorous members of the EU. And you'll spot that when you're keen on something and you get wholeheartedly involved like the Irish, who, let's face it, have milked the EU for decades for every blinking penny they could get out of it, foxy folk that they are, and people like you. People consider your problems their problems. People decide that when there are discussions with a neighbouring state, your problems are number one on the negotiating list. So the Finns are probably right to think that they have got a posse should things go wrong, although should Russia ever decide to inv uh, invade Finland, we'd be in a very different ballgame. In any case, that would be a huge issue. So that's why they're doing what they're doing. The Swedes were very doubtful about the EU, and it's strange that actually across most of Europe, the parties that are very pro the EU tend to be right wing. Lefties tend to be suspicious. They tend to think it's a rich man's club, um, and they have kept their distance. But within Sweden, which of course has been an extraordinarily lefty country, um, in the 1930s it created the People's Home. And some of that was modelled on the beverage report in Britain and our welfare state. But while we let that atrophy and die, they have expanded it and understood the thinking completely. So Sweden has the smallest pay gap in the developed world. Britain has the largest in the OECD. Uh, so the Swedes looked at the EU and thought, hmm, if we join there, our standards will probably be pulled down. Now, that again is a small sentence to say and a big thing. Those of us of an age, again, will remember the dark days of Margaret Thatcher, sorry to mention it, when the only thing that was kind of speaking to a different set of values was very often the EU. The working time directive, I mentioned it at a meeting in Dunbar, in Denny, actually, a couple of days ago. And a guy came up and said the first overtime he ever earned was after the working time directive was implemented in Britain. This was a huge difference, this kind of outlook where you should not be worked to, the, to, to, to death in a workplace, where you should have time off for bairns. These kind of things were just so straightforwardly true for the social democracies in the EU that they put forward a framework most Scots would have given their eye teeth to have as the fundament of our welfare state. So I think actually that a lot of the kind of 62% that voted to stay in the EU 
A lot of that for people my age and older is because we remember that. We remember the different framework that the EU had of values that spoke to us. They were like a big sister for a while, for as long as it could work. So think about that. We look at their maternity, paternity, environmental protection, all these kind of things and think, wow, that's gold standard stuff. The Swedes looked at it and thought it was too low standard for them. And that speaks volumes about the difference in our societies of what we've come to expect. So the Swedes were very dubious, but eventually um, in the late 19, in the 1990s, after the Berlin Wall had come down, that worry about Russia had slightly dipped. Their own economy was having problems and they thought that trying to get sort of socialism in one country wasn't really cutting it. They needed to try to expand their thinking into the EU, so they joined. And um, you may not know that you know, but their current deputy prime minister is a massive fan of the EU. She is a woman called Isabella Lovin, and you may have seen a picture of her uh, that was tweeted widely around the place, signing an executive order with all her female ministers behind her as a brilliant repost to Donald Trump and all the heavy guys behind his one. But what was she signing? What she was signing was an executive order that was committing Sweden to redouble its efforts to combat climate change. And believe me, there's probably no country on the planet that's doing more already. Why? And why her keenness on the EU? What she's saying is that America is out as a thought leader for the next five years. In fact, let's be honest, it's probably been a AWOL for a wee whiley. Who is going to start picking up the big issues about climate change, about migration, about fairness of divvies up of the world's resources? Who will take the lead on any of these issues? She's asking, if it's not the EU, we're going to make it work. And you listen to a young woman with that level of idealism in a country like Sweden and you think, by gum, would you not like to be beside that? Well, there's the lineup. You've got Denmark beside them, which joined the EU the same time as Britain. Actually, they've been kind of thrown. They've had more referendums on aspects of, of EU policy than anyone but the Irish, and they've had a right number, um, but they're still there. And after Brexit, there was all sorts of gloomy predictions that all these countries would then suddenly have their own exits. They haven't. They had polls which suggest that roughly 60% of people are still okay with the EU. Yep, they want some changes, but they want to keep that solidarity together in the face of a fracturing world. So here is Scotland's other possibility. Um, the lineup, the back four, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Scotland. That's tasty. Again, these are the kind of people we need to be talking to more because they have been places we need to go. And the extraordinary thing, for any of you who've been to any of these countries, you'll know, is that people are so willing to help. I've been running Nordic Horizons for six years and inviting people to come over here. Not once has a single person asked for a fee. They may be here for two or three days, they contribute their time because it's kind of the greater good. Now, this is an extraordinary time to be alive and to be in the run-up to independence because we are sitting beside like-minded siblings who have been there in every single respect, who have got models that we could really learn a lot about that we're half getting to anyway, who now speak English better than we do, let's be really honest about it, which is a big bonus ball. And partly, that's the Norwegians uh, decided they didn't have a big enough film industry, so they imported all the sit British sitcoms. So if you learnt your English watching a combination of Faulty Towers, Monty Python and Father Ted, you can say that their, uh, their colloquial English is pretty blooming good. Um, but these nations are there to help us. And there is no reason why a nation that has actually got probably more of an asset base in terms of energy assets and, and other assets uh, than any of these other countries, there is no reason why we shouldn't be looking in a medium term way to be joining them. And so we've got a choice. It's a brilliant choice. It's a choice that would be the making of us, whichever way we choose to go. But the 
thing we have to do is try to think that that is the point of all of this. If we get scuttered down so that our ideas about independence get ground down into what day will the referendum be called or what will we call the campaign or what structure, these things are important. They really are important. Um, and I'm a member of the Scottish Independence Convention. It's an umbrella group for all the yes groups. Have we got our own house in order? No, we haven't. Have we got any money? No, your forward shop over there has got more cash than we've got. Do we need to do something about it? You're blooming right. But all the time, we've surely got to remember that our sight should be just like that window that's changed at the back from a big gaping void into something beautiful. That's where we're going because we've got pals, we've got possibilities. And coming back finally to Jan Baldwin Hannibalson, the redoubtable old trout himself, uh, when he was asked if he thought Britain could join EFTA, he just said no. And when someone else said slightly tremulously, because uh, he doesn't take much nonsense, what about Scotland? He said, you're a perfect fit. So we've got possibilities. Let's just go there, decide what we need and take them. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're all fed and watered, we can proceed with uh, some questions if you feel inclined. John, this had better be good. It's UDI will come very shortly. Next question. <laughs> well, um, the Pharaoh, pretty, pretty teetery actually. Um, the, the Pharaohs are just a territory of Denmark and uh, Denmark does the reserve powers of defence, um, macroeconomic policy, although some of that shared as well, and foreign policy. Um, so it's, there's not a huge relationship and actually one of the things that's quite stunning about the Pharaohs, I was there, was it last year, there's a, currently there's a Republican majority and they want independence again. But what they think they need to do, they want a seat in the World Trade Organization. They want the pharaohs to be there in their own right, 40,000 people. Um, what they're doing to get there is that they are determined to become economically independent first. So they're sending the grant from Copenhagen back. I know. I said, can I just make sure I didn't misunderstand you there? <laughs> and had to go through it two or three times, but that's the plan. So they're weaning themselves off subsidy. And UDI means, I mentioned it before, is Unilateral Declaration of Independence. So that's when you just say it. Like this is me unilaterally declaring that I've told you this twice now, John, right? <laughs> okay, you're fine. Well, you know, having edited the, this, this book, and by the way, thank you for buying, <laughs> you know, there's a great, uh, I'm, it's probably a saying in every one of the countries, but I see it most often in Norway, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Um, so thank you for um, moving some of those books. But um, uh, it's really hard to know, having edited it all, there's real, you know, there's, there's real difference, there's benefits to either solution. And a lot of it depends on getting closer to what Scotland's interests are. I mean, like Finland, we are in bed with an elephant. Like, like Finland, we have a, a land border with a larger country. Um, we, we might think, therefore, that actually, you know, we, we may be in a more analogous position to those countries that trade with, with neighbours very strongly and across borders. We've also been a member for, since 1973. These other countries were all kind of, you know, they decided never to join. But we've been there. It's one of the reasons that uh, the woman whose name I keep forgetting, who uh, is the EU representative, Rona Lightfoot, I think, uh, in Britain, 
Um, she had said during the, fir the in last independence referendum, she was the one that said Scotland would have to go to the back of the queue. I mean, there is no queue. That's not the way it works. But she has now changed her tune, Begora. She's the one who's saying, actually, Scotland would be pretty well straight in because we already comply with all the regulations because we've been members for 40 years. So, you know, there are those things that are different. I have a per particular feeling that Scotland needs to get a grip of its natural assets. And that comes to fishing and farming. Now, I don't have a great confidence that my interest in this is shared necessarily by the Scottish Government. Um, I would think that we need to change the whole subsidy regime for this and a lot of the way that, that we conduct our business in fishing and farming. So that's one reason that I would, I would have some interest in the North Atlantic solution. And you've got to say that those, those North Atlantic little sub-states um, and states like Iceland are hypnotically impressive. I'm not hearing you properly without the mic. With regards to Scotland being in the European Union. Yeah, but the thing is, and the, the, you know, I, I understand that people think that you can renegotiate some of these things. You're not going to renegotiate the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policy very easily, because both of them rest upon ideas about, um, about freedom of trade, freedom of movement, um, freedom of, of investment around. Um, and that's part of the underpinning of the difficulty with the fisheries agreement. So there's no question that if there, an independent Scotland was uh, going for membership of the EU, and you know it's not a minor point that 62% of Scots think they voted for that, albeit in a referendum that in a classic British way is pretty binary. Um, if we were going into that, there's no question a Scottish government would argue a better deal for Scottish fishing than the British government ever did. They sold fishermen out, totally sold them out. And, you know, we know, we can see what they're doing again. We're no dummies. Michael Gove, you know, trips off to Denmark, thinks nobody will notice, and starts talking about um, trading, um, you know, a cash for access, basically. And access to what, I wonder? Yeah, probably their traditional fishing grounds, most of which are in Scottish waters. So, you know, there's, so there's difficulties, but this is the point. I don't know definitely which of those options is best, but just from starting off and looking around you, you can see that there's two pretty strong alternatives. Um, those who are favorable to the EEA say that the EEA is very unlikely to change over the next wee while, although of course if the UK jumps into the middle of it, it'll be smashed to pieces, whereas the EU faces some tough times. Um, there's all these arguments, and that's the politician needs to be able to sort of sift those around. But actually, the public need to get involved. I don't know if there are fishermen or farm, farming community people in here, but you know, you, you need to start thinking yourselves and help the debate. I'm no blooming fisherman. I don't know. I'm only picking up what I can from people around me. Aye. Yep. In all these discussions, we've been talking about about economics, jobs, agreements with each other. Where do you think the arts are going to go in this? Because if I, I, my opinion is if we don't have the arts, we all might as well chuck it. Well, yes, actually. And, and funny you should mention that because um, in addition to everything else, I've been, uh, I set up a Nordic landscape exhibition which has been touring around Scotland. And one of the things that strikes me really powerfully is when you look at a lot of the brilliant painters from all these nations, but again, particularly Norway, uh, you notice something really significant. Um, it is that all the landscape art they have has got people in it. It breaks my heart. The idea of Scottish, uh, the Scottish kind of idyll of what is thought to be most strongly beautiful and iconic about the Scottish Highlands is the monarch of the Glen painted by Edwin Landseer from London, about glens that had just been cleared of every human being. And we still identify that. It's in the Blinken National Gallery. I was there last week. So I think uh, this might not be your, this is a point I want to make, which is that when you begin to look at them, you see some other things. Their museums are full of their own stuff because they didn't have empires. They haven't got stolen goods on display. 
Um, and that really makes a big difference. I went to a museum in Tromso, which is in the Arctic Circle, and uh, the main exhibit in it was a microscope that was trained on a little piece of what looked like wood. And it was right at the middle of a whole display. You had to wait in a queue to look. And when you looked through, you were looking at something. It was hard to make out what it was. It was, stone, it was the teeth imprints of a Stone Age child on a piece of amber within a bark of a pine tree. Now, from that, they had then got a huge exhibition about the amber trade, about how long pine trees lived, about how all those kids lived. Where is our story in our museums? It's totally absent. I, want, I, I possibly didn't make it clear enough, and you've answered it terrifically. It's, I was thinking of the arts in the broadest sense. Celtic connections, our big orchestras, music in the schools, all these things that seem to be getting chopped at the moment. How do we cope with that? Well, it's a difficult one, but actually I would go just back a wee bit here because I think there's an even bigger problem underlying it. I don't know about the schools here, clearly I'm a blow-in, but from schools with my stepchildren's, uh, from my stepchildren's area who are in East Lothian, um, I've been to their school concerts and there's not a single Scottish song sung in them. They're all whatever, you know, the latest film is. And okay, I get that. When we were young, we probably did much the same. But actually, the amount of Scottish input there is, is completely dwindling. Um, so I think there's a, there's a bit of a problem with cuts, that's true. But I mean, I think in our days, I don't know if it was funded whatever we got. It's felt to me like it was very much people that had a passion that passed it on. And it looks like we're going to end up doing the same thing. It's a very good point because actually in the period that we've now got where we don't have a definite date for IndyRef 2 and we're kind of all standing waiting for the gun to be fired, there's plenty of things to do. And a lot of that, to, it strikes me, should be cultural. I mean, whether that's, I was uh, at an event that was re restarting Bothy culture in Inverness. And this was, <laughs> here's me using a microphone, but this was no microphones. This was small gigs in old tin hall, you know, tin, corrugated tin, wood panelled interiors, lovely curried in wee places where the audience might only be 40 or 50. And it's people from the local area who are standing up doing the entertainment. Well, you know, that's part of our culture, but Bothy culture died when, you know, Bob Dylan used, you know, plugged his guitar in. So there's, there's lots of things from that to actually doing summer schools is a thing I would love to do. The Irish do summer schools. There's six weeks in the summer where all the kids get a chance to go off to the Gael Tacht. Um, they learn about Joyce, about all their literary greats. They learn supposedly an Irish Gaelic, but mostly that, you know, that's a bit debatable. Um, and it gives the economy in these areas a huge boost, but it lets the kids learn something from passionate enthusiasts. And I'm not trying to diss any of the teachers who are here, but it's off-piste. It's not curricular-based, it's passion-based. You know, we could be doing that here as well, summer schools. But all of, you know, this needs something in the government. This needs some structure um, to get those big ideas off the ground. In the meantime, you've probably got in this room a university. You know, you've got a people's university of cultural knowledge. You will do. And you can turn it around that way if you want to. Well, there's that too. Although I think we're no bad, I think we're pretty good at writing songs and so on. Half the problem is the distribution to get it out beyond ourselves. I, th I think there's a position vacant in the Scottish Arts Council right now. And I think it needs a Scottish person to lead it. Well, that's, that is, you know, this is a significant thing because these are issues you cannot raise without being called a Philistine or racist. But it is the case that there has not been, as far as I understand, there has never been a Scottish um, director of the Edinburgh International Festival. Alistair Hetherington, I think, directed The Fringe possibly 40, 50 years ago, and that's it. Um, and if you point out that, you know, there, there is, in, in, in my experience, in culture and in the environment, there are a lot of people who come in from Firth of Scotland. And that's an interesting one to me, 
um, in, in, in the environment, in land and so on. I have a feeling that sometimes Scotland feels to us like uh, the way I used to feel about the lounge we had in Belfast. I was in there probably about four times in my life. Every time, did, did you ever have a lounge like that that you couldn't go into? You know, it was too special for the likes of you. Um, and kind of when you went in, you just were very careful that you didn't put anything dirty anywhere or yourself or whatever, and you felt uneasy. What are we like? You know, we're tiptoeing around this place like so it we're in somebody else's lounge. And the thing is, that's inherited and learnt behaviour because it's been true. It's been true for centuries, and you don't switch those things off quickly. So I think Scots don't feel confident about being in charge of our own environment. The things that there are fewest numbers of Scots in are the things that are most important, but about which we feel most uncertain. And that's because historically we've been squeezed out. We're not sure if we've got a culture. Of course we know we've got a culture that's worth going on about. But you know, when you get to things like, where was the protest? When it was Robert Burns, I'm trying to think, whatever it was, anniversary, 125th, 150th, not that long ago, there was not a thing on network BBC. Now, there is no question that Burns is a poet of international stature. I can remember being in the north of Norway and try, on the 25th of January and trying to explain to my host why I was feeling a bit odd about it because I'd not really been out of the country on the 25th before and he'd not really heard of Robert Burns and couldn't understand it. As we were talking in the street of this little town called Cherkinus, which is 13 kilometres from the Russian border, right up in the north, a guy with a kind of, you know, the classic Russian big sort of fur hat came past, heard the words Robert Burns and stopped in the street and said, are you Scottish? And I said, yeah. He said, this is Burns Day. And I thought, see, there's my boy, you know. And he says, yes, my heart is in the Highlands and I would go there now. My heart is in the Highlands. And I, t I turned to the Norwegian guy and said, uh, see, you know, he's kind of like well Kent. And the, the Norwegian guy says to the Russian, he says, why on earth do you know anything about a Scot? And he says, he is not just a Scot, he is a liberation poet, not a program on the BBC when it was a significant anniversary and we've got Shakespeare coming out of our oxters and we've got Dickens coming out of our oxters. Now, I do not grudge it because they were pretty good too. But the point is, if we were a Great Britain that meant anything, if we were a Britain whose culture was the product of the best of the parts, we would not have to keep supplementing it with international stellar talents who are ignored. And where were we when that happened? You know, I, I wrote about it actually in Blossom and I didn't protest. I was ground down by it. Nobody thinks the BBC will pay any attention. They're probably, they're absolutely right. But you know, this is the problem for our culture. We have to keep reimagining its status. We have to keep trying to sort of explain why it rises in us. And all these things, we shouldn't have to keep explaining so much. We should be able to enjoy far more. Right, that might not have answered the question either, sorry. <laughs> like, you, like you, I admire Iceland and the Faroes. But there's another small island nation much nearer to us than either of those two. And that's the Isle of Man. It's not in the United Kingdom, not in the EU very high standard of living, and the people are very happy there. I've got in-laws there, and I've been there, highly impressed. Yep, absolutely. I mean, they've got a slightly different model, I think, there. You wouldn't, I don't know that they're trying so much to model themselves on a social democracy in the Isle of Man, but, you know, the point is, when you've got your own government, you can decide what you want to do. So, yeah, it, they're very often ignored, and you're right, it's, a, it's an example that's slap bang in front of us. I suppose what will happen is that people will often look at something like the Isle of Man and just say that is too small an example upon which to base the arguments for a large nation like Scotland. But you get to a stage where we're too small to stand on our own feet, but we're too large to take any comfort from comparisons with perfectly functioning neighbours. So, yep. Well, we were actually attached to the Scandinavian landmass originally, and England was actually attached to another 
piece of earth entirely. So uh, we did, in fact, belong to a different continent. That's true. Right, we need to, <clears throat> and after this, we have to have women asking questions or I'm going to sit down. Right, and I'm, I'm, so you better believe me, right? Come on, gals. Just got a quick one there. On the BBC, you've worked for the BBC. How do you feel that the BBC uh, treated us through the referendum? And I'd also like to ask a supplementary question, and that's about the 400,000 people that were born first of Scotland. How do we convert them to being pro? Independence. I didn't catch the 400,000 people who are born first of Scotland, out with Scotland. Right, yeah. And how do we get them to support? Actually, I'm saying yeah, and I still don't get it. The 400,000 people who are first of Scotland. Born, born first of Scotland, out of. Oh, you mean Scotland. right? Okay, so. I don't uh, mean English. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean. People yeah, we're trying not to say incomers, right? But that's okay. Yeah, that's right. And, and t touching on the, the arts, Alistair Gray had a hell of a time when he yeah. complained about the number of non-Scots running the Scottish. Well, he did. The thing is, he did. Um, I, I think again, I can remember writing about this in Blossom. But he did use emotive words like colonizer, and I can't remember the other. There were two categories of people. One was a colonizer, and one was something that was just as offensive. So actually, if you really are trying to communicate something, you have to struggle very hard, as you did there, and I didn't hear you properly. But you're trying not to use the word incomer. Well, good, because you know we know that's just pushing buttons. If you want to go around annoying people, yeah, it's easy. You just bang them over the head with words that, you know, cause an instant, instinctive defensive reaction, and then you're surprised at the upset you've caused. So, I just, I, I'm sorry. Uh, his you call emotive words, they were his words. Why, why should he have to guard his words in his country? Because if, if this is just an awareness. We're all different, right? Now, my approach to everything, in, right? And he had something Do you want to say me? I'm that trying that to out, outline my answer to it here. Right. And it is that, like, my, my interest in life is to try to get as far as I can towards someone who disagrees with me and that really relies upon not setting off any landmines between us. So, you know, of course, he's, he's entitled to say whatever he, is, he, he likes. That's absolutely true. All I'm saying is that if we were trying to get into some of that area, it would be easier to do it without raising immediate hackles if we could get just not describe people as colonizers. Because, you know, colonial colonizers, I mean, that's a, quite a strong thing to say about English, whoa, about English people who've come here who have very often contributed in a big way to society. And if you disagree with that, you're looking at one. I was born in Wolverhampton. It, you, you, need to, you need to look more carefully at his distinctions. If you want, I can look it through in the book. But that was part of the difficulty, and this is my opinion, was that if you use language, it's, it's basic that, that will let people run to an emotional response, you lose the capacity to have the argument you want to have. Now, here we've gone about it again. I don't want to discuss ta name tags or tactics. I want to discuss the fact <clears throat> that Scottish people are not in charge of, of the cultural mainstays of Scotland. And we're not able to have a discussion about it. You know, if you looked, if you looked in Ireland, a friend had come back recently from the Hurley finals, it was Galway versus, I'm trying to remember, and the whole of Ireland was pulled up in that, very tied up in that match. And it was on everything. Now that's a, it's a beautiful thing to realize that an indigenous sport um, captivates everybody's attention in a way that football doesn't in Ireland. But we're different. You know, that's something to aspire to, but we haven't got, I mean, we don't have, Shinty doesn't have the pool of Hurley in, in Ireland. But we have the, the, we have the right and we need to start getting in to be able to put more of our own culture up top. Um, for example, the um, trying to think, the fireworks display at the end of the Edinburgh Festival um, cost more 
than the entire budget for Celtic Connections. Now, the thing is, it was nice, wasn't it? You know, okay, it brings, it helps the economy of Edinburgh, yada, yada, yada. I mean, yeah, but actually, I think if a lot of people were able to choose, they would put more money into Celtic Connections. But we can't even have that debate because it sounds Philistine. I have been called Philistine more times than you have sat scowling at the back, my friend. I mean, I actually uh, had a bit of a go at the portrait gallery for not having modern Scots in the portrait gallery. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Okay, I apologise for you. you. You are, from my perspective, it's hard to talk when you see somebody that looks so angry at the back. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> But the point I was going on to make was that the Portrait Gallery, for example, in Edinburgh, um, actually had a policy, I think until 1982, that they couldn't buy a portrait of a living Scot. I mean, it's an extraordinary Victorian kind of conceit that the only people worth having on anything are people who are long dead. But the result is a gallery that has very little space for contemporary Scots. The thing that struck me most strongly about it was when um, George Wiley died. Now, I don't know if you all know George Wiley. He was a fabulous, eccentric sculptor and many other things. He did the crane at, uh, in, in Glasgow at Finiston and hung the straw boat from it. He did straw locomotives hanging over the edge of piers at Oban and Fort William. And actually, the bust of George Wiley was in the, was in the basement at the time like, you know, there's a rotation for all the Scots because they have such a limited space within the portrait gallery to be exhibited in. Personally speaking, I would take half of George III out and put all of us, all of our people in. Am I allowed to even say that? No, I'm not. You really need to bellow, I can't hear you. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is, I mean, people, if people know about George, they absolutely love him. They love his cheek. I'm trying to remember the thing that he had at different ends of the M8. One was a candelabra, I think, at the Glasgow end, and then there was some wee sniffy thing at Edinburgh just to kind of have a bit of a get it up you to them, you know. And the thing is, that sort of, you know, humour is well understood, and that's kind of our culture, but it exists in the margins. I live near Dundee, and um, Michael Mara, who lived there was a blooming genius of a guy who was rated. I mean, many people said this guy is a, is a, is a wordsmith on a, on a parallel with Burns. And he, he is, if you haven't listened to Michael Mara, blooming listen to him. When he died, I found myself having to explain who he was to people. And honestly, it's one of the most upsetting things. When you know somebody should be known by everyone and you somehow find yourself the inadequate vessel to try and capture an entire life of brilliant, mad, barking, eccentric, insightful work. Why was he not on television? Because he was a bit odd. You know, odd's good, odd's fine. Why is Elaine C. Smith not on television on the BBC? She's apparently not got enough character to hold a series together. I think that answers a question I might have been asked about 100 years ago about the BBC. Um, just as a final thing on the BBC, uh, I, think, I think the thing for the BBC in the referendum was actually a, a very un unfortunate die was already cast in the Iraq war, which was the time that I left. Because basically when Greg Dyke walked the plank and the BBC lost the battle with the British government over the dodgy dossier, you might remember, the BBC just pulled right back from anything that looked like confrontation with the establishment, the government, or the authorities ever again. And I know, because I was in there, I was just saying um, that, you know, you get to a stage where we were at war, we were in the Iraq war, and there were still producers that thought we should be discussing litter because we got more phone calls on it. Um, and basically, a dumbing down happened, a retreat from things that were difficult, and that set the template for the next big difficult thing that walked in, the referendum. It was utterly predictable that they wouldn't be able to handle that because they'd spent the previous decade 
um, pulling their horns in away from anything that was controversial and unable to think that they are innately reflecting the view of the establishment all the time. So it wasn't, it was a poor show. And the thing that I most object to is even not instances of bias. It's the sheer weariness of the whole thing. I mean, this was the most exciting time to be in Scotland, was it not? Right? Well, how was it? I met so many journalists who were like, oh no, not another debate, not another. You know, it's, that's, that's the shameful thing, how misrepresent, how, what a kind of misfiring there was between their approach to it and our experience of it. Um, I'd like to say that um, we didn't get Castle Tower, but South Cal Community Development Company is still in existence and now looking at new assets to try and acquire for our community. So down, but certainly not out. Um, a question, I did some work a number of years ago where there was the Deserve Project, which was where Scotland uh, partnered on research projects with Norway, Sweden, um, Finland, etc. A lot of work done, a lot of money spent, went nowhere. But one of the things that certainly I learned in this bit of research I did was that you can't take policies, really, really good policies from Scandinavia and just plunk them in here because if you only have half the infrastructure or the system, it won't work. Um, how do you think we could actually get the kind of basic infrastructure and the thinking and the policies right so that we could actually import ideas and use them well? Yeah, you're very right. Um, we, it's, 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 it's probably an unpopular thing to say, but if you've grown up in Britain, as most of us have, and you haven't lived a long time abroad, you are British up here. You have a series of expectations um, which are of a top-down society in which the winner takes all, the devil takes the hindmost, it's competitive, it's pretty uncaring, it's kind of exciting if you like that sort of thing. Um, and that amounts to what we think we're working with. So for a lot of people, um, doing well to being a bit more humane in that system is as good as it gets. So basically, if we can do a couple of percent better at England at stuff, to be blunt, then a lot of people think that's pretty good. So for example, not in the last elections, local elections, but the previous one, the turnout in Scotland was 38% average. Uh, but the turnout in the England for their local elections was 30%. Result of mundo. <laughs> now, this is, this is the way people think about achievement. And you'd have to say that's actually the way the Scottish government often thinks about it as well. To be fair, unless you've got control of more of the money and levers, it's kind of hard to make transformational change. That's what's needed. Um, some of the change, some of the differences that are the most pronounced, in fact, probably the most pronounced difference between the Nordics and us, is the amount of power that's held at local level. Now, you know, I say this over again, people go, oh, like they were looking for something a bit sexier. That's it, folks. Because what that actually says is, the people of these countries have a very high opinion of their own capacity. And what we have in Scotland as a result of a top-down hierarchical experience topped with feudal land ownership, which meant that the same guy for our grandparents' generation and, and beyond, the same guy was a feudal superior, a landowner, a landlord, an employer, and very often the convener of the local council as well, if you were the Duke of Buccleuch, Johnny. Um, that, that kind of experience is completely disempowering. And we are still working that through. It is not possible to flick a switch because much um, as, as I was ex expressing a belief that we can be the nations that are around us, we certainly need to be doing some work on the, the structures that keep us hesitant. And unless we get a better idea of our own capacity, I don't know how people will come to, to think that if they are not allowed to run significant things in their own community, how will they be able to run their own country? Um, I see a pretty strong link between those things. 
And the places, the Catalans actually was talking about this recently, and a guy in the audience sent me a long thing about the nature of local democracy in Catalonia, which again has got tiny councils. I know some of you have heard me talk about this before, but seriously, just to get this one statistic, the, the average population of a local council in Scotland is currently 170,000 people. And as usual, nobody in the audience is bad now, lad, because how would you know? You don't go on holiday and say to folk, what's your local government set up like? You know, so we don't know if that's big or small. It's humongous. The average size in the EU nations of a council doing the same is 7,000 people. If we look at Germany, let's forget the Nordics for a minute, but if you look at Germany, which has got to be the most successful economic state probably in Europe, the average size of its council is again 7,000 people. The average physical size in, in, in Germany, 15 square kilometres. The average size in Scotland, 950 square kilometres. You're having a laugh. Now, the reason that this all matters is that this is a feudal structure. Feudalism didn't just apply to land ownership. It applies the template, the template of not trusting the little people with control and ownership is a virus that has riddled its way through every aspect of governance in Scotland. We are worse than England, I'm afraid. We have community councils. Now I know there'll be community councillors in here. God love you that you put your effort into something whose average budget is £400 a year that has to be spent on stationery. You know, this is pitiful, and I'm sorry, but what it speaks of is a chronic lack of trust of the people. And whilst that's all going on, it's really difficult to say that we don't have the average normal experience of running things, but actually we'll be all right in the night when we become independent. I think there's a huge problem in there myself. Hi. Oh, and you're talking about local level is where it's got to come from. I think this legislation is actually a very positive. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, you may know I've spent a lot of time supporting community initiatives. I was a trustee of the Isle of Egg Trust for eight years up to the buyout. So I'm a great believer in people trying to get the whole ahead of things and getting control of them. But here's the thing. In right-sized democracies, there are no community buyouts. Think about it. You know, if you have a decent system, why does a community need to buy its way out of it? There is not a single community land buyout in Norway because they've got their land laws right. And so I'm afraid that the thing that's happening in Scotland is that we have, for some reason, a chronic fear of changing systems. So, you know, what will happen is you'll get all sorts of workarounds, and that's what the Community Empowerment Bill is, is about. It's not saying, let's look at these oversized councils, which, by the way, COSLA, the council's representative body, has said are far too big. Like, that's turkeys not just voting for Christmas, but jumping in the tin and chucking oil over themselves. They want at least 100. If we had the European average, we'd have 517 councils, and you'd be sitting in the middle of one of them. So, you know, it's great the community thinks what I hope it's doing is giving people a taste of power um, and then beginning to ask why systems don't make it easy for everyone to have it. Like, let's talk about egg for a minute, the People's Republic. Um, what the egg acts did, stunningly clever thing, um, they ha have, have given land free to young people to build housing in a shared equity system. What that means is kids build the uh, housing, usually with help from other people. If they ever go on to sell their houses, at that point, they pay the full cost of the land back to the Isle of Egg Trust, who then give the money to somebody else. And the result of that is that young ones have got a two-bedroomed house for £40,000, made of local timber. Because the other thing is, there was always a terrible fear that local timber wasn't strong enough you get much denser wood the higher north you get because it takes longer to grow. 
So what have the guys done? They've just doubled the size of the beams. This is revolutionary in its small way. That's why egg is a massive success story. Why is this not happening all over Scotland? Why is there not land being taken over and given for free to people to build two bedroom houses for £40,000? We would transform our health, our idea of what's possible, our experience of running things. So sure, egg being a community buyout has been an extraordinary thing. They've also got a kind of award-winning off-grid electricity system, Eggtricity, which is a combined hydro, solar, and what's the other one? Wind. How could I forget wind on egg? Um, <laughs> you know, they've got that combined system, which means that they finally were able to switch off the diesel generators they'd been dependent on for donkey's years. You know, so when people's ingenuity is released, by gum, they start making brilliant local solutions, but it's one here, one there. You have to fight for the cash. You have to compete with your neighbours. You have to get burnt out. You have got no structure behind it. Sometimes it's not quite democratic. You know, all these things are inherent in the way that we're approaching change at the moment. It's piecemeal. It doesn't need to be. I would like the Scottish Government to be giving tenant farmers in Scotland the right to buy, the same as the Irish had in 1903, and giving them the long payback period to do it. The Irish farmers had that right in 1903, and they were given a 60-year repayment period. Of course, some of them actually didn't end up being in Britain for long enough to pay back very much at all, but it transformed Ireland. It's why you go around Ireland and you see signs saying, beware people walking. Who's walking here between settlements? They're too far apart. There's nothing to walk to. Leslie, I think we better kind of start to round this up. Um, we're, getting, we're supposed to be closing at 9.30. Sure. Well, do you want to do it then? Well, um, I, I don't know. I think there's another question across the other side. So, you're a you're a perverse old uh, master of ceremonies, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Is this the last question then? This last has been trying to ask a question. Have you know? Right. You've gone quiet again. Okay. Right. 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 I just wanted to know what the hell we can do about the BBC. There was nothing you do. I don't know what you can do about the BBC. Well, you know, but the thing is, I, I wasted 18 months of my life trying to set up a public service radio alternative to Radio Scotland, and the Scottish Government didn't put any money into it. So, you know, there's people trying to come up with, I'm, I'm fed up doing that now. But somebody younger will have the energy, and it'll work at some point, but the Scottish Government needs to put money behind alternatives. And they're, they're at the moment, they're worried about offending the majority, Majority? Is it? Who knows anymore? I think probably a minority of people um, who think the BBC is the voice of, of reason. I think the BBC knows how much we despise it. <laughs> I don't know anyone. No, they don't. I mean, <clears throat> Elaine C. Smith, who's the convener of the Scottish Independence Convention, and myself actually had a four hour meeting with the new controller of BBC Scotland, Donalda McKinnon, who's actually a very nice woman. And uh, we went through everything. And she listened. Now, you know, not seeing massive changes yet. You may notice on a lot of programmes there are, is now an independence person, or actually two sometimes. I mean, that's a heady experience. But uh, it's not gone very far. The only thing you could say is uh, that idea of having a meeting in the previous controller would never have happened. So she recognises a problem. You know, I know I don't think they've got an idea. But the thing is, I'm, I, do, you know, do you not feel this yourself? I am not a negative person myself. I just like to see things being created. So I don't want to waste another minute arguing with somebody who doesn't want to listen to me. I just want to find a way to display the extraordinary stories, people, blah, 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 that we've got loads of. And we need to get the, the resources behind that to be able to put a vibrant alternative out. Now, and it could be radio. You say, okay, this is me. Um, TV takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of bandwidth. Radio is a much simpler thing to get up and running. Bower Media run a lot of the commercial stations in Scotland. 
uh, this fellow, Aunt Ian Ritchie, who can count, and me, went into Bower Media about six years ago and tried to buy their medium wave frequencies off them because they're only retransmitting the FM music on medium wave and it's rubbish quality. Um, so we said, well, if we could buy the medium wave thing, we'd have an instant network of speech. And they wouldn't sell it. <laughs> they said, this company has a policy of never selling assets. Now, the thing is, that was another, that was the 18 months. And I thought, do you know something? I'm just knackered now. There's no support from the Scottish government. We've tried everything. But somebody with more energy and a bare cash, they're still there. They're still replaying their FM on medium wave. It still sounds rubbish. I merely say. Leslie, I should um, independence this weekend. How do you see that going? It's going to be a disaster, actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about it, but it's like a, a head-on collision. It's like a Spanish bullfight in the mating. It's, it's, it's shocking. Um, I see that the latest thing is that um, the, the Madrid government has forced Google to take down links about it. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Um, I think that nine million of the voting papers have been confiscated, which actually means at a practical level, I don't think they can actually now have a valid election. But on the other hand, there's no way people are not going to, are going to sit back and sit at home on that. So there's a, there's a real impasse, and I don't know how that works its way out. Th these guys, we were talking earlier, um, <laughs> The, the idea that, that these guys who are able to mass a demonstration that had people holding hands from Barcelona to the Pyrenees can be put in a box is like it's not going to happen. And I think it's, it's throwing all sorts of challenges up for Britain because a lot of people are looking at that and beginning to think that's, that is, there's a pattern of heavy handedness here of states that are actually also breaching EU regulations. I mean, some of the regulations that are applied to new countries wanting to join the EU are respect for self-determination of nations, which Spain is now contravening blatantly and nobody is picking them up on it. So I, I don't know, it looks like it could get very messy this weekend. And I wonder what the Scottish government's position will be because they were slow to get involved at all recognising that the Spaniards, if riled, could just block our EU membership or indeed EFTA membership if they wanted. But I think this weekend will force everybody to stand up and be counted. You want to take one from John there? Right, John, what is it? <laughs> no, you're all right, go on. Microphones, I you will do? just speak. I've got a microphone, you beauty. Uh, um, what most people are worried about at the moment, and I mean big time worried, is the Third World War. And we Scots have the right to get rid of bloody trident if we choose. And all we need to do is bloody vote yes. And it's done. And it's done. Right, yep. Okay, I, I agree with you. That's, that's very true. Well, well said. Well said, John. Yep. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of a fascinating night. Not only do I want to move a vote of thanks to Leslie for coming here and speaking to us, I want to move a vote of thanks for her colossal injection of enthusiasm into us all. We know what's in front of us now. Thank you very much. Thank you.